Let's go down the meta hole. So, there's this video I put out. It's called Difficulty Begets Hot Blooded Fandoms. The video is broken up into two, somewhat three segments. It starts off with a whole thing about how difficulty makes people care about a thing they like more because they had to put more effort to get into it. And then it breaks down into this long tirade about how shitty Fate and its fans are. Now this part of the video is a joke. The end of the video then points out the fact that this part of the video is a joke. However, in spite of that, the joke is still misunderstood by a lot of the audience because they don't understand which part is the joke that the end of the video is talking about. Where the joke begins is precisely in the line where I state that the difficulty of getting into fate is because visual novels are shitty. This is obviously retarded because thousands and thousands of people love visual novels. People love the fate visual novel. But I go on and on about how shitty this visual novel is and how in order to get into fate you have to bear with all this shittiness that obviously most people don't think is shitty or else no one would play the fucking game. That's why it's a joke. And it goes on and on, because the real point here is just to shit on fate, to vent over being upset that I got a bunch of shitty commenters on my fate video. But of course, people can't tell which part of this is a joke and which part isn't. People are interpreting that the joke is, like, not that I'm saying incorrect things, but that I actually, you know, believe that this stuff is all real, but me just, like, being an asshole is a joke. No, the whole thing is a joke. The point is that, again, no one could possibly have this opinion. It's so outrageous to say that, video, that, that no one, that anyone who likes fate just likes shitty things or had to put up with this shitty game because, like... <sighs> But see, this brings me to the question. Why do I still pay attention to this? Why do I still read comments at all? I honestly don't know. I don't know why I do it. I don't know why. It doesn't make any sense. I mean, I think there was a period where I escaped it. I actually got away. I don't read comments on most videos anymore. I only read them on videos where I'm interested to know how it's going to be received. Um, and before I started this journey around the country, I kind of got out of reading comments entirely. I wasn't really reading them much at all, except for like on my Reddit board. And then, uh, you know, I guess because I came back and I'm sort of getting back into the swing of things, getting back into the swing of making videos and posting them, I was interested to see comments again. But they're worse than I remembered, you know. Reading comments is just a bad time. And it's completely unnecessary. There's no reason to do it. You know, like, all those negative comments, all the ones that are angry or misunderstand the point of the video, don't represent even the majority of the audience, much less the ones that actually matter. If they did, I wouldn't be in this house, this entire townhouse that, I've, that I'm renting based entirely on Patreon money. Because I have so many people who enjoy my videos and care about them and understand them, who support the channel, that I'm able to live an entire life based on it. So obviously the other comments, they don't affect anything. They don't matter in terms of like the grand scheme of things. And yet, because so much of making YouTube videos is reactive, so much of it is about like this push and pull, this conversation that I'm having with the audience. But there's no like, there's no way to tell. There's no, there's no way to like rein it in so I'm only talking to certain people. There's no way to like, talk to an audience who will get it. And even when I say in the video, you know, hey, this is a joke. People who watch the channel will get the joke. Other people might not get the joke. And then people comment like, I'm one of the people who doesn't get the joke, you know? And then they like misinterpret it and extrapolate on it. Like, I guess exactly what they're mad at me for doing to fate. So, you know, good on you guys. You won. You made the point. If you try to join into something and you don't understand it and you whine about it, you come off as a fucking asshole. So yeah, I guess that's why nobody enjoys the Fate video. But really, the problem is, 
that I tried to reach the Fate fandom at all. I shouldn't have. I should have hidden it from them, because it's not for them. This bitching about Fate is not for Fate fans, who obviously are going to feel differently. They obviously aren't going to want to hear this, but it's not for them. It's not a video for people who like Fate. It's a video for people like me who think the Fate franchise is dumb and want to complain about it. You know, because they're sick of Fate fans. It's just unfortunate that the people who are going to watch a video called Fate Apocrypha every week are going to be Fate fans. I should have, I should just title it like, I mean, we're probably not going to continue the Fate Apocrypha series because, um, fuck it. But I should have just titled it like, hey, fuck Fate, here's a video. You know, fuck, fuck Fate. If you feel that way, watch this, you know. Because I'm, I hate, I hate, I hate, I hate. I just hate. I have hatred in my heart. I'm a hateful man. I'm a hate, a hate machine. I hate lots of things and lots of people. I don't have good feelings for lots of people. I have good feelings for a few people, you know, the good ones. I got f good feelings for the good ones, but fuck the other ones. Fuck all the other ones, the not good ones. Fuck them. I don't care what they have to say. I mean, I do care, but I'm trying to stop. I'm trying to avoid it. Put it out. Put it out of mind. I can shit on Fate all day if I want to. I'm, not, I'm just not going to read the comments. I'll just shit on Fate all day and not read the comments. There, victory. I've, I've won. I've achieved, I've achieved Nirvana. Welcome to my house. Welcome to the meta hole. Welcome back to Alcohol on Sundays, the only alcohol review show that was canceled and came back thanks to sheer popular demand, only now it's embedded in the middle of the metal hole, I guess. Uh, I'm drinking Three Philosophers, my favorite beer, period. It's from Oma Gang, a brewery that's in New York, same state that I'm in, it's probably nearby, Copperstown, don't know where that is, uh, but you know. Maybe I can go see the Oma Gang Brewery sometime. But these guys, you can find these beers um, up and down the East Coast. I think they m might be available nationwide. I'm not sure. <clears throat> yeah, in any case, they make craft beers. They've got a decent variety of them. But my favorite by far is Three Philosophers, which is a triple, uh, or was it quadruple? Yeah, quadruple ale. I don't know what that means. It says... Uh, 98% quadruple ale, and 2% ale with uh, chives added. So yeah, um, most importantly, it's like 9.5% alcohol by volume. Very strong beer. Might even be more than that. I really can't read with these fucking sunglasses on. 9.7% alcohol by volume. So pretty strong for a beer, um, and more, more importantly, it's fucking delicious. It's, uh, hmm, how would I describe it? It's got a sort of light taste to it. Um, not like light beer, but like, you know, it's not super bitter or super hoppy. It's, I mean, it's, it's bitter. It's a craft beer, but it's not dark. It's not, um, it's not going to make your throat go like, Ugh, you know, it's, um, it's pretty easy to drink. For being 9.7% alcohol by volume, it is highly drinkable, which is more than I can say for a lot of beers at this, uh, at this level. And whereas Golden Monkey, which is pretty similar, I would say, to this, um, Golden Monkey does, isn't as flavorful. This has a much more full flavor, in spite, again, of being highly drinkable. Like, I would say most beers that are like 9.7%, you're gonna get something like Arrogant Bastard or Dragon's Milk, which are much more of like sip beer, like take a sip and your whole fucking shit is fucked for a little while. 
Um, this stuff, you can just, you know, you can fucking get through it pretty quick. Um, the only thing I don't like about Three Philosophers is that it's a little expensive. You're looking at three or four dollars for one of this size of bottle. So, like, you know, fuck. I, I bought a four pack and it was like 15 bucks. So, yeah, they're, they're a little pricey, um, depending on where you get them. Oftentimes you can find it in the giant bottles for like 12 or 13 dollars. But, uh, you know, I splurge for it because I love it. It's, uh, it's fucking great, man. It's just delicious. It's just so, it's just a fun drink beer and again, gets you drunk really quick. So, um, I would say basically, if you like Golden Monkey, this is like Golden Monkey, but more flavorful. Um, it, you know, it's in the same realm as some of the other beers I've talked about. Um, <sighs> it's really good. I really like it. I highly recommend it if you can find it. The hardest part is finding it. Um, it's not sold, you know, everywhere. If you live in New York, they got it at Wegmans. If you live, uh... Elsewhere, if you live in Virginia, they got it at Farm Fresh sometimes. If you have a beer store nearby, go to your beer store. They might have it. If you live in another country, I doubt. But I doubt that for most of the beers I've had on this show. Mm. But yeah, this is backed by popular demand. People really like alcohol on Sundays for some reason. Um, so here you go. It's back. Now every Sunday from now on, there'll be alcohol on Sundays. Welcome to the Meta Hole. I grew up on the internet. I started using the internet when I was like eight, and I started participating in online communities when I was 11. I'm 25 now, so that's a long time, more than half my life. My entire active memory spent online. And as I've spent more and more time away from the internet, I've come to really deeply hate it. On some level, I hate what it's always been, and on another level, I hate what it's become. Because the internet's not what it was when I got onto it, or when I spent a lot of time on it. It's different now, because everything's been put in one place. The internet has been condensed into one tiny little room where everyone is. And it has completely defeated what I think was the original appeal of the internet. I think the appeal of the internet originally was that if you didn't have anyone you could connect with in person, you went online to find people you could connect with. And you would join some kind of small community. You'd join a forum, you'd join a website, or you just, maybe you didn't even participate in discussion online. Maybe you weren't like a part of a group, but you went on there to see other people doing things that you appreciated. You went on there to see people doing things that, you know, no one was doing away from the internet. What is this strange music coming from this lightning video now? Gibbon, what are you doing to me? What is this? What am I hearing? Whatever. You went on the internet because there was something you couldn't get offline. But the internet, because of Google and Facebook and YouTube, which is Google, um, oh, that video ended. They've condensed all of the internet down to a few small places. And what this means is that the internet is no longer a bunch of small communities of people like like-minded individuals hanging out. Now it's just everyone in one place. And it sh it should it, there's advantages and disadvantages to it, right? Greater communication between different kinds of people. Everyone's kind of melting together and we all get to like understand one another better. But on the other hand, now you're just in a place with a bunch of people you don't relate to who are watching you and looking at what you're doing and judging you. And I mean, it's essentially the same thing as what we all hated about the, the offline world. You know, if you were in, if you were from a small town and no one in your town understood you, but they all understood each other, you know, they were a community and you were an outsider. The internet was a place where you could find your kind of outsider and hang out with them. But now, the internet takes your, your little group that you had, you know, your safe space, let's be honest, and it just tears down the walls of it. So everyone else is either invited in or they can look at it and they can talk about it. And you're expected to participate in this, this global 
community. You're supposed to be a part of this thing, and this thing has a complete identi identity crisis. It doesn't know what it wants to be. It constantly is casting judgment on itself. And, like, the thing is, this this is not good for us. This is not good for in us individually, you know? Like... There's there's an ideal. There's this idea of like everyone banding together and we all agree on something and it would be like that that would end all conflict in the world. But it's not going to happen because we all disagree on what this consensus should be. And hey, maybe this is all a great experiment to figure out the consensus. Maybe we're the generation that's thrown under the bus because we have to figure all this shit out. And as we keep battling and battling, eventually a consensus gets reached and everybody's on board. I doubt it's happening though. Because more likely, we'll all splinter off again and form new communities again. We're in that awkward phase where everyone's standing shoulder to shoulder and being like, I kind of want my own room, you know? And eventually we're going to break off and make our own rooms again. And there's places where that happens. You've got Discord, where people are making their own little chat groups and hanging out with their own little cliques. And that's cool. You know, there's still places where it's happening online. But it, it, I just find it awkward that now... Let's say you want to be a successful video maker. Use myself as an example. Why not? Why not just be obvious? This is the meta hole. Um, you know, there used to be a time. Let's say uh, Mega Tokyo, the web comic, which was the. I, I learned a lot about anime from participating in the Mega Tokyo forums. You've got a website, megatokyo.com. If you're not interested in Mega Tokyo, the web comic, you're not going to the website. You're not going there because you're not interested. So everybody goes to Mega Tokyo, and, you know, it's all fans of the comic, and they go to the forums, and they discuss the comic, or they discuss other, other stuff, and at the very least, we know everyone here at least has this one thing we're all connected by. We all just want to talk about this comic, and whatever other things we happen to be interested in. And then eventually, the forums of Mega Tokyo split into smaller communities. You've got this anime and manga board, where all the big anime fans, who happen to be fans of Mega Tokyo, participate in this board, and it develops its own culture, and it's its own little clique and group. And if you're an outsider to that group, if you come in and you don't get it, or you don't appreciate it, you leave. You go somewhere else. You try to find another group. But now you can't have a website like that and have it be successful. You can't have, like, you know, the guy who made Mega Tokyo, if he tried to come out with that webcomic now, would not be successful. Because the internet has pushed everything into one place. So now you gotta be a YouTuber. You gotta be on YouTube. You gotta have a YouTube channel. You gotta be, you gotta be in there. And YouTube is everyone in one place. Everyone's here. Now, you can subscribe to a YouTube channel and, like, participate, like, you can be like, oh, I'm a part of this channel's audience. But the channel's audience is not its subscribers. It's all of YouTube. It's anyone who happens to go there. And everyone on YouTube is watching and judging and, and being a part of this. And there's no way to, there's no, there's no wall. There's no way to be like, hey, I've got my channel, and if you like my channel, stick around, and that'll be its own little community because we're all in this YouTube community. And that's why there's so much drama and so much attention paid to, like, who's who and what's what in the YouTube community. Because, you know, we're all under the same roof, even though maybe we shouldn't be. You know, I would be much happier. I know I would be much happier if Digibro was a website, you know? And I'm not saying I don't want voices of dissent people who disagree with me, people who want to argue with me, that's all fine. What I hate is that I'm, I'm being put into this bigger group that I have no interest in being in. I don't want to be part of the YouTube community. I don't want to be part even of the anime YouTube community, really. You know, I'd love it if the... I, I've tried a lot to change the anime YouTube community, to try to, like you know, state what I wish it would be and what I want and, like, try to get more people to do things more like how I do it. But, you know, I'd rather just have a community that's not the YouTube anime community, like a separate, here's my guys, here's my group, you know? And to some extent, I have that with the procrastinators. And that's one of the cool things about the procrastinators is that we have, like, our own sort of fan base and our own sort of clique. And granted, that's come with a lot of problems because... You know, um, fans of one of our work might not be fans of the other of our work, but they are all, they're all PCP fans, and that becomes a problem for some people. But, you know, 
I just, I I'm kind of miss when the internet was about, you know, meeting people who were sharing the same interests as you. The internet didn't used to be people just constantly fucking arguing about everything. It wasn't always like that. And when we did argue, it was usually about, like, I don't know, a show, you know? You had people on a forum arguing about whether or not dot .hack is good or something like that, but we're all friends at the end of the day, you know? It's not this constant attempt to, like, character assassinate people for doing things differently from the way how you do them. Because it's literally separate communities fighting each other because they've been put into the same community space. We've been put in the same box when we belong in different boxes. And, you know, it's just the way that the landscape of the, of the internet has changed and shaped that way. For the last two months, I mostly escaped the internet entirely. I barely read comments, barely read, you know, barely watched YouTube, barely participated in anything online. And I had tons of fun. The last two months were fucking brilliant. Because I spend all that time hanging out with like-minded people. People who I like. People who I'm friends with. I met them all online, sure. And the internet's still great for meeting people. But to me, the goal of the internet should be to meet people and then immediately get off the internet with those people. You know, find someone you like and get them off the internet. As fast as you can. Because it'll... The, the PCP, we talk in a Discord group. You know, we don't talk in one another's comment sections. We don't talk in a forum. We don't talk online in general because online sucks. We don't want to do it in front of an audience who's going to, you know, fucking constantly try to involve themselves in the things we're saying. And this is also why, again, the PCP fandom can be a bit of a problem because, like, we, we, are, we all understand one another. And sometimes we bring up things about our personal lives or each other in the podcasts but we're inviting people who aren't a part of our group of friends to now see the things that are happening in our group of friends and judge it and make their own calls about it. And it's, you know, it can be a pain in the ass, especially the non-fans, the ones who aren't a fan of all of us who are going to, you know, uh, raise hell and fucking be assholes. And I'd rather just be able to just talk to my friends, you know. And the most fun I've had is... Over the course of these past few months, I've just been spending time with people I really love, you know? I've spent a lot of time with my girlfriend, who I really love. I've spent time with Endless Jess and Best Guy Ever and Blind Skywatcher and Munchie and, uh, uh, you know, some of my online friends like Econ, Nino. Like, these people are fun to hang out with. They're fun to spend time with because... They're good people. They're people who understand me and who we can communicate with each other. And I've had more fun talking to those people than I would ever have in a comment section or on Twitter where everything I say is going to be responded to by somebody whose opinion I don't want to hear, who isn't thinking the same way I am, who is, you know, coming at it from another community and doesn't get where I'm coming from. Am I saying I want a safe space? Yes, I am saying that. We all want that. Why would you not want that? Nobody wants to be constantly surrounded on all sides by enemies, by people who are trying to fuck with you. You know, like, that, that it's not going to help you. It's just going to make you miserable, you know? It might make you better at arguing, but it's going to make you miserable. So, if you can escape all that, you know, you can make it to a a better a better place, the outside world where your friends are. I keep hearing noises from the other from the from the neighbor's room. Am I being too loud? What time is it? It's like nine. Let's move somewhere else. I don't think those noises were related to me because they kept going after I stopped talking, but whatever. We're now in the center of the house where you've got the uh, air conditioner noise. Would I turn off the air conditioner so that it, you know, stops making noise? No. Because then it would get warm and I'd be uncomfortable. This is, this is basic logic. Now, I can't deny the strong possibility that my problems with the internet have more to do with me doing it wrong than with it having changed so badly. Maybe I 
have been participating in the wrong places. Maybe I shouldn't be on Twitter. Maybe I shouldn't be on YouTube. Maybe there's another way. Maybe if I created a patron-exclusive chat room, then I'd get lots of great conversation about my videos, you know, and not have to read YouTube comments. And I could leave the YouTube comments on because I'm not going to read them anyways. You know, there's probably plenty of ways to go about this. I'm no longer impressed as much with discussion as I once was, you know. It used to be that a huge part of why I made my videos was that I wanted to hear what people thought of them. I wanted the affirmation, the, like, you know, to be, rem to be told, hey, I appreciated something about your your video, you know, and I still want that to an extent, especially just to make sure I'm not fucking up, you know, I want to make sure that people are satisfied with the content I'm putting out, that my fans don't hate me now, but, uh, you know, in a way, the numbers speak for themselves, I'm not losing subscribers, my like ratios are still good, my Patreon's still healthy, so, you know, I only need so much affirmation. And when you have to weed through all the bullshit, all the trolls, all the garbage comments, all the people who don't understand, who are just popping in because they heard there was controversy, you know, wading through all that to get to the good stuff is not worth it. When I can just completely ignore it all and just stick with the good stuff. There's a lot of people who find that to be somehow cowardly or like, oh, you can't take criticism. Well, no, I can't take criticism. Why should I? Why should I take criticism? You know? But you're a critic. Yeah, and I don't send my videos to anybody who I criticize. There's such a huge difference that seems to be misunderstood by a lot of people between leaving a comment on a video and making a video about something. Because when you make a video about something, the, the ball is not even in the other person's court. You know, Reki Kawahara has never seen my videos about SAO, nor would he care. You know, I don't send these to people. I make videos critiquing things for my audience and myself. When people come in and criticize me, they're just stepping into my fucking space and telling me I'm a piece of shit. Why would I abide that? Why would I want that? You know, people who I don't even know, who have nothing to do with me, criticizing my videos. I'll take criticism seriously when it comes from patrons. You know, people who are actually lining my pockets. Like, if they don't like the videos, I have a problem. You know? If Rando A, who doesn't even like the concept of anime analysis, is a problem with my videos, he can fuck off. People have it so up their, you know, people are so up, up their own ass about this idea that, like, Oh, you're on the internet, so you have to be ready to be hated by people. You have to be ready for shitty comments. You have to participate in that. You don't have to participate in that. You don't have to. It's not in your job description. It's not part of what it means to be a YouTuber. It's not part of being online. It's just assholes who want to do that, who are trying to sell you a narrative that you have to participate so that they can keep doing it, so that they aren't a bad guy in their own mind. They have to justify their actions by telling you that, you know, you're wrong if you don't participate, when you don't have to. They don't set the rules. They are worthless idiots who you don't have to listen to, you know? If it's not affecting how you get paid, you don't need to worry about it. If it's not affecting your own, you know, your own self-worth, don't worry about it. Just, it doesn't matter. None of it matters. These people just want to matter. So they're going to convince you that they matter, that you have to participate in what they're trying to do to you, and you don't. Because they don't set the rules. You set the rules, insofar as you can afford to. You know, if you can't afford to distance yourself from the internet and your audience, if you can't afford to be a dick to people and tell them to fuck off, you know, you might be in for some harder times. But I feel like I can afford it. So, fuck them. Welcome to Manga Mondays, the only manga review show that goes on hiatus for a month and a half and comes back on the wrong day in the middle of a different video. 
Today we're going to talk about the worst manga I've talked about on this show, Wada, Wada no Hara and the Great Blue Sea. Um, I have not read all of this. You can see my bookmark. That's the front cover. Um, I don't know if I can make it through this or like... I don't know if I want to bring back Manga Mondays on a manga that I think is not worth reading and don't recommend. I picked this up because it's fucking adorable artwork. This is the cutest looking thing ever, and they gave it a, a pretty swank release. Seven Seas is in this weird place where, like, half of their manga look like total shit, and the other half look amazing. Like, Galco and, uh, um, Kindred Spirits on the Roof look fantastic. This looks fantastic, and then some others, like, Bloom into You looks terrible. Um, but anyways. This manga is based on a video game. And, uh, I was expecting it to be kind of like Kindred Spirits on the Roof, like some kind of tie-in sub-story or some shit like that. And when I was reading this, I thought it was a sequel at first, because it makes no fucking sense, and it makes no attempt to explain itself. It just kind of, like, jumps in, in media res, into a story that seems to be taking place after the major events of a previous story, and it seems like it just expects you to know who these characters are and to have a connection with them, so I thought, it's a sequel. Um, and then I looked it up, and the game it's based on, which is a fucking RPG Maker game, um, just like some freeware, uh, you know, adventure story game, like mostly story-driven game, and it's, it's the exact same plot. Like, it, it, this is just an adaptation of the video game. Now, I don't know if this made more sense as a game, or if it's just, I don't know, dumb. I don't know what it is. I don't know if this picks up later. It seems like it's heading towards some kind of gruesomely bloody war. Um, you know, I read online that there's, like, it, it gets real edgy and dark in spite of the fact that the artwork is fucking super cutesy and adorable. But, like, um, it makes no fucking sense. Like, it's... And it wastes a lot of time. Like, it, there'll be a whole chapter just dedicated to a character, like, greeting another character and just dicking around. Like, lots and lots of cutesy art, and that's about it. Um, and I... I, I don't know. I'm trying to, like, if this thing is big, it's like two full volumes, and reading it a chapter at a time, I've had no interest in continuing every time I've picked it up. I've just been like, oh, this sucks, this sucks, this sucks. Um, the only thing I like about it is that the artwork is fucking adorable, you know, like, and the characters have these uh, super deformed faces that look like this, that it goes into, like, constantly. And the thing is, the, the art is very cute, but, like, it's really, like, four or five faces that repeat indefinitely. Like, everything looks the same. Every page looks the same. So there's not a lot of dynamism to it or anything. Um, sometimes it's hard to even really tell what's going on. It, it, it's just, like, a bunch of cute characters. Like, look, this is fucking adorable. That's great. But, you know... I don't know how, I, there's nothing to connect. Like, I don't care about any of these characters. None of them seem interesting. They just kind of re repeat gags. It feels like a, like, I don't know, a mid-2000s anime where all the characters are just very one note. You know, they're all flat, two-dimensional. The story doesn't seem like it's going anywhere interesting. Like, ah, uh, it's... And it's, it's like, weirdly edgy in spite of mostly being a bunch of adorable shit. So, yeah, I don't know, man. I don't know if I can read all of this. I mean, I'll try to finish it, but, like, just, I want to do Manga Monday. I want it to come back on Monday, and the thought of this being, not only this being the first thing I cover, but trying to finish this by Monday, I just was not into. Like, I don't like this book. Um, I don't recommend it. So yeah, uh, Manga Mondays will come back with hopefully something less, like, utterly abysmal. I don't know why this was published. This is $16. Like, it says it's, like, based on a cult favorite computer game, but when I googled it, I got, like, barely information about it. You know, it's like, if this is a cult favorite, it's a small cult, and favorite might be a stretch. You know, like, I don't know, ugh. I don't know why this happened, but it's, it's cute. It's cute to look at. I mean, look at this. Look at this first. Look at this first insert. You know, I would. I would have rather just bought a print of this for fifteen dollars, like a full size print, than actually having bought this volume. I mean, at least it'll look good on the shelf. I can say that. It's not ugly. It won't be an ugly reminder of fifteen dollars wasted, but.
On a broad, universal scale, the truth cannot be spoken for, because none of us have enough information to interpret it. None of us know the real truth of anything. We can't get to the heart of the matter, because we just don't have the knowledge or the, the means to get to it. And on every smaller level, everyone disagrees about what the truth is. So who's right? You can prove things, you can, you, know, you can look at evidence, you can use facts, and that's a good way to build a society. It's a good way to make it through basic everyday shit. But, you know, you can't prove anything on a grander scale. Like, let's say we all, you know, we love science. We love to say, oh, science is the answers to everything. But, like, we literally cannot prove that any, like, religion is wrong. They are. They are wrong because they were all just made up by people. You know, they, they, why would any of this shit be the correct answer? But we don't know what the correct answer is. You know, maybe there's something else that's beyond our ability to understand. There's just no way to prove anything. But everyone thinks they're right and everyone argues with each other. And in my experience online, um, it's a, it's a, it's constantly when when you're on the the level that I am of like number of comments, the number of people responding to your work, you've got ten people telling you wrong for different reasons that contradict each other all the time, every time. Like for instance, uh, this fate video that I was bitching about at the start of this video, you know, there were there are people with arguments about why me or best guy ever are stupid that contradict one another. Someone will say, you fucking idiot, it's like this. And then the next guy says, you fucking idiot, it's like this. And those two contradict each other. I don't know who's right. They both claim to be Fate fans who know everything about the franchise, but I don't, they, their ideas contradict each other. I don't know who's right. This is constant in my comments. This is why when people say like, you can't take criticism, it's, my criticism is misguided and unclear. And all of it contradicts each other. Someone will tell me, like, no one will like this kind of video in between 10 comments telling me how much they like the video. You know? What criticism do I take seriously? You're all noise to me. It's all noise. The only thing that doesn't lie to me is numbers. And that's why I always say, like, you know, as long as the patrons like it, that's all that matters. Because the patrons literally, if they don't like it anymore, they unpatron, and I can't afford my lifestyle. Not even that they're right or wrong about their opinions. All that matters is that they like the videos enough that they will keep paying for them. Because if they don't, that's the only thing that can kill me, you know? The only thing that can affect me. And even then, I can just find another audience, you know? There's always somewhere to go. But... Trying to listen to all your critics, it's like they all they all have their own ideas about what's good. So you might as well just listen to yourself. What do you think's good? What do you think you should be doing? How do you think it works? If people tell you it doesn't work that way, you go, well, I'm pretty sure it does. And enough people agree with me that I can keep having the opinion I have, so fuck off. Have your opinion elsewhere. Welcome to the grand finale of uh, Vinyl Fridays, the show that like three people really want to come back and nobody else cares about. So we're just going to go through them all. Um, Hokey Fright. This is one of my favorite albums. It's uh, Aesop Rock and Kimya Dawson, a folk singer and a rapper, both who are really good. And they collaborate and make lots of interesting, very adorable songs. Uh, 
just about like fucking all kinds of shit. Like really, every song's completely different, and they're all really good. I especially recommend Jambi Cafe, one of my favorite songs of all time. TV on Ten, I did a whole video about it. Um, you know, it's all good. Listen to this album if you like anything. It's a great album. Let's see here. What else we got? Fucking Baths Obsidian. This is like electronic, super moody music. Um, sometimes it can be a little dancey, and sometimes it can just be weird. It's sort of a, I don't know, it's like an electronic singer-songwriter album, I guess. Uh, the song Miasma Sky is a masterpiece. Ironworks is pretty good. Um, No Eyes has been on my phone forever, because it's like this really fucked up sex song in a way or love song it's like it's about being in a relationship with someone who you don't really love you just want to fuck them and like being very upfront about that so it's interesting um and also gay so you know like the 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 ro romances are gay romances if that interests you um P. Lander Z. This isn't an amazing album, but these guys put on amazing live shows. They were at Otakon one year, and they put on a fucking phenomenal show. It's a Japanese punk band uh, who are just really goofy. They dress in Super Sentai outfits and shit, and they have some pretty fun songs. Um, the most memorable song by them is Too Many Mike, which is a song about there being... Or So Many Mike, rather. Which is just about how many people there are named Mike. Because they're based in New York, so they're, you know, they're familiar with America. And, uh... Lots of English lyrics and shit. I don't know. It's a pretty fun album. Got lots of skits. It's like about them journeying through space. Um, here we've got Fuck Off, Get Free, We Pour Light on Everything by The Silvermount Zion Memorial Orchestra. This is the last hurrah for post-rock. If you like post-rock, this was the last great post-rock album that's ever been made. Um, because it did something new. It imbued lots of, like punk sound into post-rock like a very dirty production and like a more visceral angry sound and um some rock flavor to post-rock as opposed to the glistening um you know crescendo core that overtook the genre unfortunately no one took influence from this and did it again so post-rock is dead now uh, what next we got touche amore with uh, is survived by this is some post-hardcore fucking shit that's just like, it's um, dreamy but loud and abrasive. You know, all the vocals are screamed, but it's got this sort of um, almost post-rocky sound to it, actually. But um, while being post-hardcore, I would say not so much like... It's, this isn't as much the visceral post-hardcore of something like At The Drive-In. It's less angry and more ethereal and more, like, um, not uplifting, because it's kind of depressing, actually. But it's got lots of interesting lyrics about, like, you know, the hardships of being a songwriter and drug abuse and shit. I really like the song To Write Content. And, um, what's the other one I really like? To Write Content... I highly recommend and praise slash love. Both of those are really good songs. Uh, here we've got Uncle Acid and the Deadbeats, Bloodlust, which was the most recent edition of my collection, I think. Stoner Rock, that sounds like it's recorded in the 70s on a shitty 8-track out in a fucking shack. Um, or a, a barn, rather. Um, yeah, I mean, it was recorded on an 8-track, but it's got a... It's it's like a it sounds like it was recorded in the seventies, but it's using lots of like modern technology to create this really interesting sound. It's very horror influenced, very creepy and cool. I highly recommend songs like Withered Hand of Evil, um, and Death's Door. Those are probably the best ones because they have these epic guitar solos at the end of these like seven minute songs. Really cool shit. Jeff Rosenstock, Worry. This is like my favorite album right now, the one I've been listening to a lot. It's some punk rock with lots of heart and soul to it. Um, this is an interesting album because it starts off like sort of just a collection of random songs for the first half, but then the second half is like one giant, like, like this entire half of the album, all these songs just run right into each other. So it's basically like one... 15 20 minute song that's comprised of a bunch of really short sh songs that are all really cool and they bleed into each other really well it's excellent lots of fun stuff in there um and even before those festival songs a phenomenal uh fucking track wave goodnight to me is great 
Um, and then the rest of it, I recommend just listening to all at once, because it's best that way. Uh, Father John Misty, I love you, honey bears. The fucking... Father John Misty's sound is very sad and fucking depressing, but this is a strangely uplifting album because it's about Father John Misty getting married and about his relationship with his wife. Um, and so it's kind of about the whole world is shit, but at least I love you is kind of the theme of the album. Um, this is totally the album of my current relationship, particularly the opening song, I Love You Honey Bear, is exactly how I feel, and True Affection, and... All of it. <laughs> it's a great... This album is how I feel about the relationship I'm in right now. Um, so it's even more magical than it already was. What else we got here? Oh, God. This is going to knock everything over. Oh, Jesus. And we've got... Uh, we got Death Grips, The Powers That Be, um, which is two albums, really. Two short albums. The first one is Niggas on the Moon, which is just insane, experimental, crazy, industrial hip-hop that sounds like, I don't know, it's, it sounds like glitch music or some kind of break core or something. It's like totally fucking off the rails. Um, it's like 30 minutes that all bleed into each other like it's one giant song and it's fucking great. Then there's Jenny Death, and Jenny Death is, um, it's more of like a almost rap metal, but in a totally new way that's never been done before. And uh, there's a lot of variety on there. It's got some of my favorite Death Grip songs, like Inanimate Sensation on GP. But it also has a lot of songs I'm not as into. It's, I mean, it's one of the more popular Death Grips albums, but, you know, I'm divided on it myself. Uh, God. I'm going to destroy everything. Flogging Molly. Uh, Drunken Lullabies. This is fucking Celtic punk. It's like Irish folk melodies mixed with punk music, and it's super memorable. The opening song, Drunken Lullabies, you've probably heard before. It's a classic radio hit. Um, it's fucking great. Lots of great songs on here. Um, the Rare Old Times, fucking What's Left of the Flag. This is just a great fucking hype album. Put it on when you're having a drunk party with people who like rock music. Um, I'm just going to take these all down and so I can go through them without this uh, constant threat. Ooh. We Cool, the other Jeff Rosenstock album that's legit one of my favorite albums of all time. It really grew on me over the years as I listened to it more and more and continued to connect with it, particularly for the first, like, six songs, the first half. Um, is it six? Yeah, six songs. Fucking You in Weird Cities is one of my favorite songs of all time. It's just this blistering punk rock song about all of your friends having moved away and you don't really get to see them, but when you listen to the music they produce, because it's all people who, you know, he used to be in bands with, you get that sense of being with them once again and just, like, wishing to hang out with them. This is all very sad music, by the way, but in a fucking aggressive, cool way. Nausea is just about, like, a day in the life of a fucking drunk asshole <laughs> as his beers again alone, except that one's specifically about how all your friends have abandoned you and you're drinking by yourself. I'm serious, I'm sorry, which is this heart-wrenching song about like seeing someone break down at a party and just not knowing what to do about it. Um, this is a great fucking album. I'm, I love it. Death Grips, Bottomless Pit, their latest album. Honestly, I haven't been as into this album as most Death Grips because this to me feels like a Death Grips greatest hits. It's like a compilation of their sounds from all throughout their career, but none of it is the best of that sound throughout their career. Like, you know, I would say the, the best song on here is Hothead, which is the most unique and really felt like Death Grips going in a new direction, but none of the rest of the album sounds like it. Uh, their new thing that they put out, which is like this 20 minute insane fucking tape, sounds a lot more like Hothead and it's really cool. Um, but otherwise, some of these songs could, like, Spikes is about as good as anything on the Money Store, which it sounds like. Um, eh is, would have been, it sounds kind of like No Love Deep Web, but would have been one of the best tracks on No Love Deep Web had it been on there. You know, there's some good songs. Trash is good. Um, Three Bedrooms in a Good Neighborhood has an insane beat. But overall, this thing just doesn't have a good sense of flow. It just feels like a collection of Death Grips tracks from around their career. And I don't think it's uh, a strong album.
Good Kid, Mad City by Kendrick Lamar, one of the most critically acclaimed rap albums of the last decade. It's got tons of fucking fantastic songs that you can play in your car forever. It's got a deep, interesting storyline to it. Honestly, you should just watch Anthony Fantano's review of it. He says everything I would say and uh, goes in depth. So, you know. I'm Like a Virgin Losing a Child by Manchester Orchestra, their first album. This is not an album I listen to much of, honestly. Like, I mostly have it because I bought it in a three-pack of all of their albums. It does have some decent songs on there, like Wolves at Night, Now That You're Home, um... I Can Barely Breathe, I think, is a good one. Maybe Golden Tickets? I don't remember. I haven't listened to it that much, but... Um... You know, it's not nearly as cohesive as the albums that Manchester Orchestra would put out later, but you can see, you know, the origins of what would become their style, and their influences are more clear. Like, a lot of this sounds like Neutral Milk Hotel and shit, so... Or, like, you can feel the influence of stuff like that, so... Yeah. The Pimp a Butterfly by Kendrick Lamar, the most critically acclaimed rap album of the last decade, probably. Um, another concept album with a lot to be said about it. Again, Anthony Fantano's review does a lot of good work. This one has... The most killer singles <coughs> of all time, King Kunta, For Free, Fucking All Right, You, which is has the greatest music video ever, um, yeah, uh, The Black or the Berry, and I, all amazing songs, and everything in between is great too, this album's long as shit, so. No Love Deep Web by Death Grips, can't take it out of this casing because it's got a picture of the drummer's dick on the cover. This is probably my least favorite Death Grips album, honestly. Um, it's a lot more just, like, the, the sound is kind of stripped back, and it's very just, like, drums and bass, it's like, it's just, like, intense and pummeling, but tonally kind of inconsistent, because early on it seems like it's just gonna be this dark, brooding album, but then as you get into later tracks, it gets really goofy and weird, and it ends on this very, um, great song, Artificial Death in the West, that's kind of dreamy and, like, totally out of character for Death Grips, it's like a chill song. So it's kind of all over the place, which is why I don't feel like it cohesives as well as an album, but it's got some great tracks on it. Come Up and Get Me, the first track is probably my favorite. Plastic Beach by Gorillaz. Um, just the most like lush and thick and like um, thorough Gorillaz album. Gorillaz is a band known for their combination of different sonic styles. They combine hip-hop, electronic, rock, all kinds of stuff into one package. And over the course of their first three albums, they just keep getting more and more detailed and more dense and having more, more and more features until you get to Humans and it all falls apart and turns to shit. But this is still a great album. Lots of great features on here. Lots of great songs. Um, I recommend giving it a shot. I love songs like White Flag, uh, Stylo, Super Fast Jellyfish fucking cloud of unknowing there's some weaker songs on here i'd say this stands up better as an album like the album experience is better than the individual songs but a few of the songs are really great Anamanaguchi's endless fantasy the most endlessly re-listenable 80 minute album of all time it's all chiptune metal music basically this is just power metal by way of video games which is the nerdiest thing imaginable but it's fucking great the few songs with vocals are actually my favorites japan air and um what the fuck? Prom Night. Uh, both phenomenal uh, pop songs that, that in integrate with this, you know, this chiptune metal style. The final track, which is just a, a fucking, a fucking em emoticon, is amazing. And every song on this is super memorable and catchy and fun. And I've listened to this fucking countless times because it's such an easy throw-on-and-go record. Uh, Touche Amores to the... To the beat of a dead horse. I've only listened to this once, honestly. I picked it up just because I was so shocked to see it and for cheap in a store. Um, I'm sure it's good. But it sounded... Like, I only listened to it on the vinyl and it was peaking constantly. I don't know if that's because of the vinyl itself or the album. Uh, Coheed and Cambria and Keeping Secrets of Silent Earth 3. I talked about this extensively in my Coheed and Cambria rundown video. It's a great album with some of my favorite songs on it. Uh, fucking... Three Evils Embodied in Love and Shadow is a classic, Blood Red Summer, fucking The Crowing, uh, fucking A Favorite House Atlantic, all amazing, like, pop songs with a prog twist. Then there's the big epic pop uh, prog songs that can keep you to Silent Earth 3. Um, overall, just a really fun and great album. Clippings, clipping, their self-titled album, except that it has no vowels in it. 
Uh, this is like the craziest experimental rap album in that every song is totally different from the last. All of them use totally different like techniques for how the song is created. They use different sound palettes. There's a song where the rapper literally raps over an alarm clock on this album. <laughs> it's got all kinds of shit and unique interesting sounds. And some of my favorite songs of all time are on here. Body and Blood, Work Work, both fucking phenomenal, Summertime. That trio of songs is just fucking godly and the whole thing just goes in such interesting directions i don't love every song on this but it's definitely one of the more intriguing albums ever made did i do one on andrew wk's i get wet party party songs i think i did i think i might have listened to it it's great death grips the money store probably their most acclaimed album the one that really got them popular this is a simultaneously dark, heavy, intense, insane album with a strong, like, cyberpunk bent to it that's all about just, like, I don't know, painting this, this paranoid nightmare world of information technology overload. And it's really harsh and intense, but also has a lot of pop appeal, more so than any other Death Grips album, probably. It's got songs like The Fever and fucking I've Seen Footage and Hacker, which are very easy to get into, very fun, poppy songs. Get Got, which is pretty fun, and um, Hustle Bones, which is one of my favorite Death Grips songs, if not my favorite, just because it's so fucking outlandish and loud and fun and pummeling. And then the rest of the tracks are just dark and fucked up and cool <laughs> it's like a pop album gone horribly horribly wrong so yeah check it out the age of odds by sufjan stevens my favorite sufjan stevens album because it's crazy dense with tons of fun shit weird long experimental tracks with just layer over layer of instrumental tons of different electronic noises tons of backup singers tons of shit to create this massive sound um, you know, even on songs where it is sparse and supposed to sound like sort of thin, there's just so many different noises going on, so much detail. Um, fucking Age of Odds the song, eight minutes of just these epic swells, punctuating moments of relative silence. Um, fucking creepy Now That I'm Older, which is just this really dreamy sort of off-putting song about growing older. Get Real, Get Right, which is a lot of fun. Fucking Vesuvius, which is like a volcano. Um, I Want to Be Well, probably the best song on the whole fucking album because it's just this this song about being trapped in a hospital bed dying, which Sufjan Stevens was doing at the time, and he just starts screaming like, I want to be well, I'm not fucking around, I'm not. And he just keeps repeating, I'm not fucking around, I'm not fucking around. As the music gets louder and louder and louder and more intense and it's fucking insane. If you ever feel sick, listen to that song. It will represent your sickness perfectly. And then Impossible Soul, the 25 minute closing track of an already long as fuck album. Um, which is just fucking epic. It's maybe... Longer than it even needs to be, but just because it's 25 minutes, you get this... I mean, this song had to exist. It's the kind of song that you listen to it and you think, this had to exist for music to be complete. And uh, and it's a, it's a great track. Rat King, So It Goes, one of my favorite albums of all time once again. A rap album that perfectly captures the idea of the streets of New York. There are countless rap albums about living in the streets in New York, but this one actually sounds like it. They went out of their way to create an album that would sound like the, the streets of New York, and then they rapped about that over it um, from the perspective of a couple of very young but very talented rappers with very different styles who bring a lot of unique noise to this album. Um, every track is pretty good, but fucking... Canal is the big banger opener. Snow Beach is my favorite, which is a seven minute song with all these interesting like jazz samples going through and it goes through like three different phases and they're just talking about how fucking cold it is in New York, basically. Um, so Sick Stories, which is the big single with King Cruel, highly recommended. Remove Ya, fucking banger of an anti-cop song. Um, songs that, as it goes, it gets more experimental, more out there, more about like spiritual ideas and this idea of like Food, like music as food and stuff is explored a lot. Uh, Bug Fights is really fun. This is a fucking great album. I love this album. And finally, Manchester Orchestra's Simple Math, the follow-up to Mean Everything to Nothing, which I did a video on before. This one is less of a cohesive feel of an album and more like every song is a different emotion. Each track has a sort of different color. 
and is different, um, you know, a very different sound, but all of them are really fucking cool. They're just all really good tracks that capture certain emotions. You start with Deer, which is this quiet, subtle song that's heart-wrenching, and it's about just, like, uh, being on tour and how that's fucking depressing. Then you've got Mighty, which is just, like, cuts in with this heavy-ass riff. Um, I don't even know what that song's about. Pensacola is about touring through shitty towns, and it's very light and breezy, even though the lyrics are really depressing. Um, April Fool, which is like a barn burner of like a fuck yeah, I'm the guy, I'm, you know what, like, I'm a fucked up guy and I'm gonna embrace it. Um, Virgin, which is this dark, seedy, fucking evil sounding song that you just gotta crank all the way up. Final track, Leaky Breaks, one of my favorites, because it's seven minutes long and just super chilled out, and it's just like the go-to-bed-and-fucking-forget-life song. So, yeah, awesome track. That's the last of my vinyls, at least the ones I wanted to talk about. Um, so, yeah, there you go. Vinyl Friday's wrapped up. I think I could say that I'm a fan of logic, but I'm not really a fan of truth, you know? I'm not really a fan of this idea that there's, like, a truth. I mean, you've heard me rant endlessly about objectivity not existing, objectively good not existing at least. And just, you know, I think everything should have a logic. Everything does have a logic. Everything makes sense when you break it down. But it doesn't mean it's, like, true. You know, there's a difference between, like, uh, the way I am makes sense if you look at the way I was raised. But that doesn't mean it's, like, that's who I am. It's just, like, there's a logic to it, but... And you can follow that logic, and that helps you understand it, but that doesn't mean that you, like, get the truth. You you follow the logic, but you don't get the truth. I don't think you can really get the truth. At best, you can follow the logic. And that's why, you know, when it comes to, like, opinion videos, it's really just about showing your logic, showing your work. How did I... How'd you come to that solution? You know? I don't know if that's why they want you to show your work in math so much. Like... In every math class, it was always showing your work was more important than having the right answer. And, you know, in math, there supposedly is just a, a pure a pure logic. You're supposed to be able to... This is all real. You know, these numbers are real. They make sense. But, like, they're not real. The number one is not real. It's a concept. You know, there is there is no number one on like a universal scale it's just something we made up to explain a thing it has a logic you can follow the logic but there's no truth behind it because for all we know everything is actually nothing and nothing is actually everything you can't you can't approach truth so you know i, I just try to follow follow my logic